the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, this exciting afternoon with a great set of uh, speakers. So I will talk about uh, predictive models of COVID-19 severity and patient outcomes that we have developed at uh, Boston University. And uh, just to give a little bit of a context, uh, we've been working for quite some time before the pandemic on a variety of models that predict disease and important key events, for instance, hospitalizations, and also on models that uh, prescribe uh, treatments. So when the pandemic started, we mobilized like the rest of the scientific community. And we also mobilized a relatively large network of collaborators. So we obtained access to a variety of different data sets. And you can sort of see in this slide, uh, the various data sets, we had uh, data sets that were local from uh, Massachusetts, uh, from two different uh, hospital networks in Massachusetts, one from uh, the Mass General Brigham network from five different hospitals, about 2,500 cases, and then uh, uh, another relatively large cohort from uh, the Boston Medical Center, about 7,000 cases. We also got uh, some cases from uh, Wuhan, uh, China, which was the origin, obviously, of the epidemic. And finally, we were able to get access to some large national data set, so a data set from uh, Brazil uh, and another data set uh, from Mexico. So in this uh, very short presentation, I will focus more on the most recent work that uh, considered the data set, the series of patients from the Boston Medical Center. Uh, the Boston Medical Center is the teaching hospital affiliated with the BU uh, Medical School and is also a safety net hospital. And as you will see, this has some interesting implications in the findings that uh, we were able to get. So we got access to the entire 2020 uh, BMC cohort, uh, about 7,000 patients. So those were patients who tested positive for COVID-19. And just some rough statistics, about 20% uh, were admitted. From those admitted, about 23% uh, or so were admitted to the ICU. From those admitted to the ICU, about 60, 58.7% were intubated. And from those intubated, about 70%, uh, unfortunately, did not make it. And we had lots of information about these patients, including demographics, their vitals throughout their hospital stay, radiology reports, their medical history, any symptoms, uh, any lab results, any medications, and even information about depression status, zip code. And also we had information about the occupancy of the hospital at the time that each one of these patients were seen. We also had information on social determinants of health. Uh, BMC runs uh, a program uh, called the Thrive Program that everyone who has an encounter with the hospital is being given a survey. And that survey asks them, uh, asks them about need in a variety of different areas, including housing, food, transportation, help with caretaking, medications, help in getting access to medications and paying for medications, education and uh, employment. And we, a lot of the information was in tabular format uh, that is more easily uh, handled by AI machine learning methods, but also there was quite a bit of information, particularly radiology reports uh, and other reports during the hospital stay that were just narratives reports by clinicians. So we had to use quite a bit of natural language processing in order to extract appropriate findings from the text. And what we did is we developed a set of robust uh, interpretable models that can predict hospitalization, ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and death. And I'll show you some examples. I will not be exhaustive, again, in the interest of time. So first, uh, what we did is for every patient, we constructed a timeline uh, from the time that uh, we were aware of the patient testing positive and having information about this patient and uh, uh, up to the point of the event of interest, whether that was 
let's say an ICU admission, whether that was a mechanical uh, ventilation. So here is the uh, outcome of interest. And then looking back in time, we created these data buckets. We dropped any information that uh, was available just before the time of the event of interest. That is uh, for reasons we wanted models that could predict what will happen into the future. Perhaps even a first year medical student can identify a patient heading to the ICU. So we wanted the models to make that prediction with earlier information. And then you will see that uh, we obtained different versions of the models that had different cutoffs in terms of the information that the model used in order to make the prediction. Another reason we created these time buckets is we wanted to capture the dynamic evolution of the progress of the patient while in the hospital. For instance, the dynamic evolution of the vitals because we understood that uh, this was rather important. So rather than just looking at a snapshot of vitals, let's say at some specific time and using that information for making a forward prediction, uh, the exact values are important, but also is uh, trends are important as well. And physicians, when they look at patients, they sort of look at the trends of the vitals in the patient. So we developed a model that used uh, some fairly sophisticated deep learning methodologies, including uh, LSTM type of networks and uh, a transformer architecture that took as input the uh, vitals, uh, six vital signals at different uh, points in time and produced a score. And that score captured the dynamic evolution of the vitals and that vital score was then used in an ensemble model that was attempting to make a prediction for the outcome of interest. So for instance, uh, hospitalization predictions, you can see that these are fairly accurate. So some of the best models give you a 92%. Uh, this is an area under the curve. You can think of this as a measure of accuracy of the model. The best is 100%, a random guess will give you 50%, so 92% uh, is, uh, is quite, quite good performance. And you can see here that uh, from some linear models that we developed, we also found some of the factors that were important in making the hospitalization prediction. And uh, in blue, you see some of the variables that are associated with some earlier health conditions that uh, for instance, are highly correlated with hospitalization. You will also see that uh, <clears throat> the occupancy of the hospital, uh, if it was high, was reducing the likelihood that the patient is going to be hospitalized. And also you will see two social determinants of health, need for food and need for transportation, that uh, were both contributing to a hospitalization decision. So patients with those needs were more likely to be hospitalized. And I would like to emphasize the role of these uh, social determinants of health. This is something that we also saw in other data sets, particularly in the Brazilian data set that was a, a national data set. And we found that uh, sociodemographic factors were impacting uh, hospitalization decisions. What we also found was that the model, the naive model that one is able to produce is actually rather biased. So you could see here uh, how the model performs out of sample for black individuals and white individuals. And the false positive rate of the model for black individuals was twice as much as the model for as the false positive rate for white individuals. Even though we were controlling for race, we were controlling for sociodemographic uh, factors, we were controlling for social determinants of health. Despite that, the model was much more eager to make the prediction that a black individual was going to be hospitalized compared to a white individual. And correspondingly, it was most likely to make a false negative prediction for a white individual compared to the, a black individual, which suggests that there are uh, apparently 
hidden features in the data that are not visible to us, perhaps reflecting structural bias and other factors that make the model uh, make that biased uh, prediction. And there are ways, and we have addressed them in a, a paper we published in Jemia on how one can correct for these factors and produce models that uh, do not have this sort of bias. So this is, uh, these are some results on ICU prediction, uh, predicting an ICU admission, uh, roughly the median gap um, between uh, an admission to the hospital and admission to the ICU, at least in our data set was about four hours. So you, we will use different cutoffs. If you use the latest information, uh, then you get quite accurate models with uh, AUCs on the order of 93, 95%. And uh, if you start cutting off the information that you were going to use so 12 hours in advance, the performance of the model drops to about 86%. And 24 hours in advance, the performance of the model drops to the about roughly 80%. And what I would like to emphasize is that we compared these models that we developed to some standard models so that are predicting ICU admission. So there are some well-known sepsis models, news uh, so far are called, and these are fairly inaccurate in this case, indicating that standard models for ICU prediction, at least in the COVID cases, fail to predict an ICU admission, indicating the rather unique signature of the disease. And here you find uh, some of the variables that were, again, uh, highly correlated with the outcome with an ICU admission. And what was interesting to us was that this vital score that we produced that captured the dynamic evolution of the vitals pretty much tells the entire story. And there are some other variables or some lab variables, uh, LDH, CRP, that have been identified by other studies that uh, also are contributing. But if one just takes the dynamic evolution of the vitals uh, that pretty much tells the ICU admission story. Um, and uh, finally, we produced a number of calculators that we made available on, uh, on the web. Uh, these, uh, I understand, were used by our uh, colleagues, collaborators at Mass General Hospital in the early stages of the epidemic. Uh, it was very easy to input some of the key variables and get a prediction, for instance, for an ICU admission or for a mechanical ventilation uh, need of a patient. And we found that, uh, you know, we were challenged to find cases. What is the model telling me that a very experienced uh, clinician cannot uh, potentially predict by just looking at the patient? And here are some cases, and there are many others where uh, patients were admitted, they were stable for a couple of days, uh, nothing in their clinical outlook suggested that the condition of this patient was going to deteriorate, but then the model was able, upon admission, based on some uh, special laboratory results, predict that the patient was going to need uh, ICU care. So these are two cases with uh, the details of those cases. So uh, that brings me to uh, conclusion. Um, of course, uh, I'm just presenting. There have been many people that have contributed uh, to this uh, work, and I would like to thank them, including students in my group, but also our collaborators at uh, uh, Mass General Brigham, Boston Medical Center, and uh, some of the other areas where we've been able to get uh, data from. So thank you so much for, for your attention and looking forward to questions at the end of the session. Mm -hmm.